Um, so, as I said earlier, and for those of you who have come in a bit later, um, Rob and I are both part-time members of staff or members of the team of the Local Heritage Engagement Network, which is part of the Council for British Archaeology. The project's been running for three years, um, and we're coming into our final year. Rob and I have both been working for it for, well, I've been there for two years, you've been there for a bit longer than I have. Um, the project was originally set up with the aim to create a volunteer force that would be the people that would step in at points of um, local heritage issues such as uh, planning problems, uh, the closure, lo closure of local archaeology services uh, within local authorities um, and anything around those sort of issues but particularly to engage with local archaeology community groups. Um, now I did say this morning in my opening and hopeful speech that I would be bringing great hope. I have been to see Star Wars this week, so there may have been a slight influence there. Um, but I hope that this won't be too depressing because we, we've obviously come up with quite a few um, problems and blockages to that sort of, what we expected initially, I think we both probably expected this to be a lot easier um, than we thought it would be. Um, and it's proven to be um, complicated to be politically contentious with a small p as well as politically contentious with a large p. Um, yeah, so we try and produce a variety of resources, um, both written and we, we provide an advice service through email, by phone. Um, do you wanna? Yeah, and, and, and more, more, more than that, we, we, we sort of try to seek out local bodies, um, whether they are specifically have with an advocacy role that they, that they already undertake, whether they're campaign groups started um, for a particular issue, um, and work with these stakeholders to encourage them to do more in terms of <coughs> advocacy um, in a variety of different means. And we wanted to, whilst trying to carefully choose words without seeming seem too negative, come up with some of the challenge, the block, the difficult answers that we get back when we when we meet these groups or speak to them. Um, and um, and see whether there's there's any advice that sorry that you can you can help us with from your own experiences, um, and so just to say that, that we sit within the CBA, and so that that advocacy remit is a very much a core part of what the organisation tries to do. Um, it's inherently about that public and voluntary interest in archaeology and representing that. So one of our strategic aims is to strengthen advocacy um, based upon this 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 um, this public body of body of stakeholders. Um, I've put there it's traditionally a place for people who dig, people who have a passion for education, engagement, and enjoyment, whether they're professionals or amateurs. Um, but it's very much a core part of that strategy. Now we often say this word advocacy um, and people wonder whether we're talking about Christmas drinks or whether it means, you know, something completely foreign. And I think this is one of the stumbling blocks that we perhaps haven't considered, um, is the rhetoric that we use to talk about campaigning, activism, um, participation in your local democratic process. All of which, actually, when you say that, starts to make you sound like you're a momentum joining Corbynite, which can be terrifying for some people. Um, but what we're talking about is basically standing up and representing what you love most. And all archaeologists, all community archaeologists that I've ever met in my entire life, live, breathe, work, <coughs> eat, sleep archaeology. So activism and advocacy is merely an extension of what we do, or it should be. But the perception is, well, we'll go into that in a minute. Um, so the kinds of activities that we are asking people to do is things like raising awareness, which actually is a quite passive activity, um, trying to shape understanding. Not many people actually understand what MPPF is and does and how it sits in the planning framework and um, the system in the UK at all. And archaeologists working in commercial archaeology, if they don't understand it, then we can't really guarantee that community archaeologists, community activists will understand it. We want to try and champion the values and benefits, as, as Rob talked about earlier this morning, about the value of heritage, what it brings in terms of personal well-being as well as um, economic value um, to society. Holding decision makers to account, and again, this is perhaps one of the areas where 
the sort of absence of the political process as much as it could be in the UK as, as a part of normal life is an area of friction for what we are trying to do because it's not actually very normal to write a letter to your MP in everyday life. Write, you know, grumpy of Tunbridge Wells letters to the Times. See, that used to be a thing that we used to read about in the 1940s and 50s, perhaps, but actually having an engaged dialogue with your, your local MP isn't something that, that has been that popular. Um, and the final thing, the advocacy activity that we try and encourage is influencing process events and regulatory changes so if there is a, um, a consultation coming up um, within a local authority, for example, about a museum closure or museum closing times or archival closures um, or redundancies, we try and get local authority, uh, sorry, local community groups to step in and write to their MP, write to their local councillors um, and bring this up. And do you want to say anything more on that particular subject? Um, and, and no, I don't think, I think you've covered, covered that well. But um, I think we'll go on to what happens um, when we do do this. And, and this is, as I say, we're emphasising the negative, which is a bad thing to do. But, um, and, and we do meet many, many people who, who get it already. They're already engaged with multiple channels of information. They really want to get it out there. They're involved with the media. They do advocacy already. But actually, probably just as often as we get those kinds of people, we get people who come up with at least one of these these sort of stock responses. So either what is advocacy, that's fair enough, it's an ugly word, I don't think many people like it, or it's a bit political for us. And that emphasis on political, they don't want to be involved because it's controversial, they don't want to um, uh, worry that somebody else in their group might not have the same opinion as them, or that they might get in trouble if they say something, that they might be open to legal challenge. That's a conception that a lot of people have. Um, they, people say, I don't want to be accused of electioneering. Electioneering isn't a thing, it doesn't exist. Um, it, you, can't, you can't get yourself in trouble, and actually very few groups, even if, you're, um, even if you are a, a registered charity, you, you, you'll struggle to get yourself in trouble if you're a local community body. Um, we're not experts, fair enough, but you don't need to be. Um, you don't have the resources, the time. We'll come on to some, th some of the things that, that, that um, you maybe can do, but that's a common thing is that that's not what they're here to do. Um, it won't make a difference. They're not listening. People, people have this, 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 the shutters are down. My MP in a rural Tory constituency just doesn't care about heritage. There's nothing I could say to him that would influence. Um, it's not why we do archaeology. It's a really big one, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and isn't somebody else already doing that? I, th I think that last point is really, really important, and, and particularly why, why you've got cards on your tables. There isn't always somebody else doing anything about any of these issues, and there are often very isolated pockets of people that are doing it who could be linked together, which is one of the reasons why our project exists. But don't assume that anything happens and that it's somebody else's job. Mm. Um, okay, so this is a um, uh, slide that I take to um, talks when I'm meeting local... Oh, it's gone a bit funny, but um, that'll do. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, an axis in there, and the idea is that whoever you are, whatever kind of group you're involved in, um, you want to be going from this private end to the public end and from the access and interest end to the influence and involvement end. And there are lots of things that people might do it in a local group, they visit a heritage site, go on a walk, um, have a lecture, an event, and you're trying to, we're trying to encourage them to, to see what it is they already do and what is it that they could achieve if they just look to see what impact could I get from those activities that I do wouldn't um, uh, add too much burden to, the, to, the, uh, um, to what we want to do and what we have the time and resource to do. And I think that any stakeholder, be you individual, be you professional, be you amateur, be you a group, there's something on here that you probably do already and some extra impact that you could get from it if you just set yourself a target, if you reflected on advocacy um, and that role. Well, who are our stakeholders? Um, in terms of LHEN, um, we tend to work with your everyday common or garden community archaeology group. Um, particularly with the CBA regional groups. Um, these tend to be people who are very uh, interested in excavation, so they've probably come into archaeology, and this is an important point to make because we'll be discussing it in a second, 
who came into archaeology because they are uh, particularly of an older generation. They probably never had a chance to do this professionally, but they're very interested in getting their hands dirty. Or they're taking part in an HLF um, or similarly funded um, project-based activity. <laughs> it's, it's sarcastic. Um, they tend to take part in all, uh, all kinds of activities, including excavation, but a lot of groups don't actually do anything hands-on. They tend to have talks, winter lectures, produce a magazine, um, that kind of thing. Um, these are not people who are going to be sitting on roofs of historic buildings and refusing to come down. Yeah, the, I think that the, 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 the perception that we get of a lot of these local archaeology societies in a traditional sense is that that's, this isn't why they got into it. They don't want to be activists. Whereas some other types of, um, of bodies, for instance, um, civic societies are based entirely on that model of um, being a uh, standing up to defend something and actually the, the, the struggle that we have to, to, to convince people that actually this is, this is a role that you can be involved with and that you need to be involved with if you want to protect this area that you care about um, is one that we, we haven't yet found a, you know, a, a real answer for in every situation. And obviously there are, there are local pockets, and I mean, as Mike was saying, Greater Manchester is a particularly good example. Um, but there are uh, organisations such as Civic Voice that are run by incredibly passionate um, people who are very, very engaged in their local communities, in local businesses, and um, understand the sort of economic value as much as the well-being and um, social value of heritage and uh, built and uh, you know, whatever else heritage. Um, so we're trying to look at what other organisations we can approach and work with and what successes there have been. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> so problem so, with campaign crews. Um, yeah, we will... Yeah, I think that's on a later slide, but we'll, so I'll, I'll go in the order of the slide and we'll, with the last two, min two minutes, 30 seconds. Um, I put problems with existing campaign groups because, of course, they, we're talking about traditional ar um, archaeology societies that aren't campaign groups. We also have campaign groups, but the, the issue that we have with them is that they're doomed to fail in many instances because they're formed after the fact of a catastrophe happening. So hand, um, Hands Off Old Oswestry Hill Fort is one of the most brilliant campaigns that I've, well, I've seen in the heritage sector. They're so innovative, they're creative, they've got a really great band of people who are ready to martyr themselves to this cause. Um, but the decision is, is, is gone and made, the sides are entrenched. We weren't in there early enough with Shropshire County Council to say, this is what the public response is gonna be if you try anything silly. The advantage of it is that they have had an impact, probably nationally, because every other county council around the country that says, oh, I wonder if we could build 500 houses around this old hill fort, well, I don't, know, don't think they're going to want to deal with the, the stuff that Shropshire County Council have had to deal with, so probably they're thinking again. But this is a really distressing thing for many campaign groups, to face up to this likelihood of failure if you haven't laid the groundwork earlier enough in the process, upstream of when these these terrible things are actually happening. And that's the, another one is the, is the save, save Devonshire Streets in Sheffield. Um, they went to, in fact, both of these groups have gone to um, public appeal um, um, and, and lost their money um, because they were looking for what the, what the final chance is for them when they didn't really have one. And they're gonna carry on. They've gone, you know what? We kind of enjoy this campaigning. We're gonna fight them and just not let them see the end of it, great, good on them. But um, it's not a position that I would want to put anybody in um, if they can avoid it. But on the, to leave with a note of hope, um, we have brilliant people and positive campaigners working with Elhen at the moment and in other sectors. So we can learn from other sectors that work with ecology issues. Um, for instance, the RSPB has an absolutely brilliant and unparalleled power and campaign and influence. Um, we want to work with grassroots on a, a local level, um, friends of landscape partnerships, neighbourhood forums, but also embrace the digital um, and try and marry um, the demographic of perhaps what's an older 
a more conservative um, traditional community archaeology supporter with the newer and more sort of agile moving ability to move around and use different media, different uh, petitions and so on. Um, I think that's, that's, that's good. We'll whiz, we'll whiz quickly through what we what some of the steps that we're taking with the different types of bodies that we've got. Um, as, as Lorna said before, engage more closely with those groups who do have the resources and they do set themselves up as advocacy bodies. Um, if you're a local archaeology society, one thing you should be good at is archaeology. Civic societies um, usually always have an archaeological interest. Um, but they might not have that expertise to comment on the planning applications that they happen to be monitoring anyway. So link up with them um, and, uh, uh, and share, share that uh, potential to, to deliver a benefit. Can I just say yes. one thing? One good thing you can do if you're not already involved in some way, shape or form with your local archaeology group is go and find out who your group, local group is and get in touch with them. They are often um, completely lacking in any involvement or interest from archaeologists, professional archaeologists certainly from the commercial sector. Um, so making those links um, has led to very long-term and mutually beneficial relationships. Um, and we'll just move straight through these. Oh yeah, a couple of, couple of good case studies because we've got a, got a shout out to those groups that we do work with that are absolutely amazing. Um, Hands on Middlesbrough, I think it started off with a, a, a single lady on her own. She's now got 10,000 um, Facebook followers. She's a go-to person in her community by the media. Um, who ask for comments on stories um, that affect the local environment, heritage and natural environment. Um, and she's a wonderful, wonderful asset to that community. Um, CLASP, a different type of um, uh, body, they were previously HLF funded, um, ran out of the project but still had 50 volunteers wanting to do something. And so they decided to throw themselves into all manner of new uh, ventures including um, advocacy and Wing Neighbourhood Forum, neighbourhood forums, uh, neighbourhood plans are really useful tools for communities. I've sold them to at least a couple of people who've got local issues in their communities this week. But Wing Neighbourhood Forum did their local plan; it was heritage led, and then decided that they were going to carry on and do loads of other stuff as well. And they've been fantastic too. Um, and as but it's kind of capturing what Mike had been saying as well, it's about making um, advocacy easier for those groups who don't necessarily fall into those those kinds of categories continuing to help with the education continually to show them that it's easier to get involved and in supporting them where we possibly can as organizations <coughs> like us but that's to say that's not to say that you all sitting in this room today don't also have these needs and requirements because i'm sure that half of you if i sat down and talked to you about mppf would have no idea at all about what it involves so everything that we're doing and trying to sort of put online and all the materials that we produce are as relevant to you as professional archaeologists as to community groups and um, we're very very happy to discuss um, and support anybody that is interested in doing this kind of work from a professional perspective as much as from a, um, a sort of a amateur archaeology perspective. Um, and finally we're going to plug our, our archaeology matters cards um, this is uh, and I, we, we want this we wanted this to be the, the, a technique to, to make it literally as easy as possible to write to your MP to show them that there are people in their constituency that love archaeology whether you're a professional whether you're um, a uh, an amateur whether you just have a general interest in archaeology everyone can fill one of these in you can give them out to all the people that you know um, and it's one of those things that's very basically on the bottom le left of um, your um, our, our, our spectrum, an easy action that you can all take to um, influence your local representatives. And if anybody <coughs> follows um, anything that happens in Hansard, these uh, these have resulted in questions being asked in Parliament. It does work. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>